you've got your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, the first gospel in the New Testament, Matthew 28. It's also on your, your outline here as well. In fact, we created these booklets, a size that will fit just really nice and, and slick into your Bible. So if you want to bring your Bible each week, um, you just kind of file that away in your Bible. Um, then you've, you've got it for the next uh, several weeks as we're going through our time together. I'll invite us to bow our heads as we have a word of prayer. God, it's a new year. It's a new season. It's a new time. God, you remind us that you make all things new. And so first and foremost, Lord, um, make us new. Renew us. Um, do the work that only you can do in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. God, as we prepare to read your word this morning, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, first of all, I want to say, yeah, it's a new, uh, new year, a new season in the life of the church. And my prayer for each one of us here at Faith Lutheran in 2019 is that each one of us would truly experience spiritual renewal in our lives. I need it, and uh, I think you guys need it too. But I also want to say welcome to our online viewers. Yes, we are recording again, uh, both audio and video. And so uh, if you are watching this message online, welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. We're so glad that you are here and you've joined in and tuned in with us. If you can't be at church uh, this year uh, on a particular Sunday, we want to encourage you to go to the website and either listen to the audio version of this or the video version. And so uh, thanks for being a part of the journey this year as we go together. Two years ago, I fell into a crisis. And I was serving in a congregation and uh, we were at a crossroads. <coughs> And as a pastor, I was trying to shepherd the leadership of the congregation through this crossroads. And in the midst of lots of conversation and uh, discernment and prayer, the leadership of the church looked at me and said, the issues of the day are more important than scripture. And I was astounded. I was dumbfounded. And that was a direct quote from the leadership, the president of the congregation. And I knew in that moment that my time was done. Have you ever prayed for discernment in your life and said, God, if you would just make it clear to me what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> Careful when you pray that. Because <laughs> in that moment, I knew that my call was coming to an end. It had come to an end. And I was in a crisis. And I felt like my congregation had left me. I felt like I had been thrown out of a boat and there I was bobbing in the water, gasping for air, waves crashing all around me and I was struggling for every breath. And about six months later, a life raft came along. It was a group of about 10, 12 people, and they said, hop in our life raft. We, too, have been thrown overboard. And they called themselves the launch team. So I got in the boat, in the life raft, and for the next several months, we started picking up people, jumping into the life raft alongside us. And I know many of you came here from actually many different congregations, many different places. I think all of us, if we have something in common, it's we've been bobbing around, kind of drifting along. And at some point in time, someone looked us in the eye and said, hop in the life raft, come aboard. And it was this way for us just to grab a hold of something and to be in a place where we're no longer flopping around in the waves and the waters of this crashing sea. And it's felt really, really good. And so about a year ago, I stood before the congregation. Some of you were here and I said, um, folks, it's time for us to figure out where this life raft is going. 
The launch team had reminded me what King Solomon said in the book of Proverbs. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The leadership said, we have got to figure out who God has called us to be. It's not enough for us to just kind of float around in the sea and get together each and every week, but we need to start going somewhere. And so I stood before you about a year ago and invited you to be a part of this process, this, pr this process of discernment, this process of prayer, this process of conversation. And several of you stood up and said, I want to be a part of that. And so for the past year, 15 months in fact, there's been a small group of us who have been getting together, praying having robust conversation and really seeking the Lord saying Lord where are you calling us to go who have you called us to be because we know we can't just keep flopping around and floating along and so today we're putting a rudder in the water and we're firing up the propeller and we're gonna start to move in a direction that God has called us to. And I gotta tell you, I'm really excited about today. I'm really excited about the next nine weeks as we just kind of unpack the mission and the vision of Faith Lutheran Church. And I know some of us are going to uh, be tempted to just wanna sit in that life, uh, lifeboat, that life raft and just keep floating along. And if that's you, just know that you're welcome here. And we want you to know that, that's a safe, that this is a safe place for you. But I also need to let you know that we're moving in a direction. My hope and my prayer is that every single one of us would put our oar in the water and start paddling together in a direction where we believe God is calling us. And so this morning, if you've got your mission and vision statement, I want to invite you to pull it out. We're going to talk about our mission. Our mission is growing disciples who grow disciples. Growing disciples who grow disciples. Yes, it is based on Matthew 28, the Great Commission. It's about people who are following Jesus. Growing disciples who grow disciples. Now, I think we hear uh, the Great Commission, and most of us think to ourselves, oh, those are familiar words. I even know the Great Commission. And we think, yeah, we're all about making disciples, people who follow Jesus. I'm in. Um, let's do it. Let's grow disciples. But I think oftentimes we just kind of stop there. And we don't really think about truly what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. So let me share just a little story with you to kind of start to get us to think a little bit about what a disciple is, who a disciple is. About 15 years ago, I was serving in a congregation. It was a mega church. We had average weekend worship of 4,000 on a, on a particular, uh, any particular weekend. We had a staff of about 60. Um, I was in charge of the junior high and the senior high ministry. We had uh, 450 kids in our junior high program. We had almost 300 students in our senior high program. I was responsible for training the small group leaders to work with the junior and senior high kids. We had 140 small group leaders to work with our young people. That's more than here that were here today. They were my small group leaders for our junior high and senior high. And every week, these junior high and senior high kids would get together. And by the way, I had a staff of four. There were five full-time staff that worked with our junior high and senior high students. And we had a great time. They were some of the most fun, creative, energetic staff I have ever been around, even to this day. And every single week, we would think up the craziest, most 
fun, wild ideas, whatever it took to engage those kids. And I could share with you stories all day long about the crazy, fun, engaging things that we did with those kids. And we did the fog machine and we did strobe lights and we'd throw watermelons off the roof. We opened up the sanctuary and played mass volleyball with balloons. I mean, the stories go on and on. One time we picked up a guitar and we just smashed it just to like shock and awe. I mean, we were all about engaging kids, getting their attention, and it worked. Week after week, Kevin, your heart just broke a little bit, didn't it? <laughs> week after week, we shocked and awed these kids, and they continued to show up. We had the largest youth group in the state of Minnesota, and, and we just thought we were really doing something extraordinary. It was really exciting. It was really fun. I got to tell you, it was so much fun. And one day, there we were sitting in our office, and uh, a, a young woman stopped in, and she, I don't know if she was in her 20s or 30s. She said, hey, how's the ministry going? I'm like, oh, great, you should have seen what we did this week. And we told her all about it. She's like, wow, man, you guys haven't slowed down at all. That sounds so awesome. I remember back in the day when I was a part of this youth group and all the fun and neat and crazy things that the staff did then. Oh, it was so great. And we're like, yeah, so great. And then one of us, I don't remember which one of us, said, hey, where are you going to church now? She said, oh, I don't go to church anymore. She said, you know, after I graduated from high school, I visited a lot of churches. I went to a lot of churches. But there was never a church that was entertaining, engaging, fun, exciting as this church. Man, you guys just, you got it going. And we, and we thought to ourselves, wow, man, we are so great. Nobody can be, you know, our church. We've got the greatest youth ministry ever. And she went on her way. And we got to thinking about it. There was no success. We had raised a generation of young people to be entertained. And it was really humbling, I gotta tell you, because we could entertain kids all through junior high and all through senior high, but we had not grown disciples of Jesus. We had created short-term consumers of religion. And I think today when we talk about growing disciples who grow disciples, we think about how many people are we going to get to come through those doors and sit in these chairs? How big of a building can we build to do the light show and the sound show and the entertainment and the engagement and all that stuff? And it goes on and on and on. When we think about disciples, growing disciples, we think about how many people can we invite and get into this room to come to our thing? But that's not at all what Jesus was talking about. In fact, when we started getting serious and humble at that church about who God was calling us to be, we said we're going to be done entertaining kids and we're going to disciple them. <coughs> and you know what happened over the next couple of years? You got it. Our church got pruned big time. Down to just a couple handfuls of kids. And I got to tell you, I stood in front of a whole lot of parents who were not happy with me at all. Because I was no longer entertaining their kids. We were serious about discipleship. You know, this is exactly what Jesus experienced during his three years of ministry. He came on the scene and dozens of people started following him, then hundreds, then thousands of people because Jesus could do some really neat things. He performed miracles, he could feed people, he could heal people, and there were just thousands and thousands of people who followed Jesus around and watched what he did because they were enamored by all the extraordinary things he could do. In fact, there were so many people that would show up to Jesus' church services that he would have to slip out the back door, get in a boat, go on the Sea of Galilee, and sneak away. 
Because the masses were following him everywhere. Remember that one day where he fed 5,000 men plus women and children? Another day he was out teaching and preaching. 4,000 show up. I mean, Jesus was a spectacle. Make no mistake about it. And he could draw a crowd like nobody could draw a crowd. Until that day came when he said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and die. And everybody disappeared. As long as Jesus was doing exciting, fun, neat, interesting things, the crowds showed up. But when it came to discipleship, truly following what Jesus was all about, the crowds became fickle and walked away. In fact, on that day when things were crescendoing and getting really interesting and exciting, there the crowds were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And on Saturday, after Jesus hung on a cross, there was a group of uh, 11 men and a handful of women huddled in a room. They weren't really sure what to do. And their commitment to Jesus and being a follower of Jesus was pretty shaky as well. And then on Sunday when he rose, those 11 men and that handful of women, they said, we're in. We are committed to following you. A couple weeks later, Jesus, Jesus showed up and met these 11 disciples. We pick up in Matthew 28, about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Great Commission, many of us know this text very, very well. And I think this is where it gets really murky for those of us in the life of the church, is what does it mean to make disciples, to grow disciples? And I think one of the reasons why we get this so wrong so often is because we stop listening to what Jesus says. Let me read it to you again. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do whatever they want to do. <laughs> teaching them to obey. <coughs> and if you've got your Bibles or you're on your outline, you may even want to underline that word, obey. Because that's truly what a disciple does to follow Jesus, is they obey. Everyone in Jesus' day and time loved to hear Jesus tell stories. They loved to watch him do miracles. They loved to watch him heal people. But what they really didn't love was doing what he said they were supposed to do. Right? And as I talk to people today, Oh, Jesus is great. Jesus is wonderful. I love Jesus' teaching. Oh, I love all the things that Jesus taught. Isn't Jesus great? I just don't want to do what he says we're supposed to do. It's our same obstacle. It's our same barrier that so many people had in Jesus' day and time. And, and, and of course, the thing that's missing is sacrifice and commitment. We just want to just read Jesus. We just want to learn about Jesus. We just want to ponder Jesus. We don't want to actually do what he has to say we're supposed to do. You know, I, I think about this one of Jesus' most famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the, Pound, sermon on the Mount. We know this. It was in Galilee. And as Jesus is teaching the masses on that day, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit and blessed are those who are hungry and, and all these things that you can be blessed. And, and in, the, in the midst of this sermon, 
he looks at the masses, he looks at the crowds and says, enter by the narrow gate. Don't enter by the wide gate, enter by the narrow gate. What is the narrow gate? The narrow gate is obedience. It's actually following what Jesus has called us to do. The wide gate is whatever else you want to do. It's everything else, right? Jesus, when, when he says, enter by the narrow gate, he's not casting judgment on people. He's not saying, gee, this is how many people are going to be in heaven. And by counting them up, he's not saying, this is what God wants, is that only a handful of people go to heaven. What Je There's no judgment in that statement. What Jesus is saying is, this is just the way it is, folks. Most people want to enter by the wide gate. People don't want to enter by the narrow gate because it's uncomfortable, it requires commitment, it requires sacrifice. If you want to be my disciple, enter by the narrow gate. If you want to be my disciple, obey my teaching. You know, the interesting thing about the word disciple is that it really doesn't uh, have religious connotations to it at all. A disciple is simply someone who learns from someone else. A disciple is someone who, spent, who, who makes a commitment to spend time with someone else and learns about how to do life. So when a baby is born, uh, they learn how to walk, they learn how to talk, they learn how to behave, how to spend money, how to make decisions because their parents are their primary disciples at that point in time. They just do life together. They hang out together. The child looks up to the adult, makes some observations, they have some conversations, and so a parent, uh, they are discipling their child. I remember when I was a kid, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine years old, I wanted to play piano. And so um, five houses down the street uh, was Jackie Larson, and Jackie Larson taught piano lessons. Awesome. I'm in. That sounds really interesting. And so every week, um, I would walk down the street with my piano books to Mrs. Larson's house, and she would teach me about the keys, the pedals, the sharps, the flats, the notes on the, on the piano, the notes on the, uh, the, the, the piano book. And it was great fun, and it was really interesting. And Mrs. Larson would always leave me with the same instructions when I left. Make sure you practice your piano uh, 30 minutes every single day this week. Okay. Until I found other things to do. Until practicing piano got to be a little bit of work. Until there was a television show on. Until my friends wanted me to come out and play. So I quit piano. I was no longer a disciple of Jackie Larson. Because I had TV to watch, and friends to play with, and all sorts of different things to do. See, being a disciple is really about making decisions. You can do whatever you want, or you can make decisions and organize your life around whatever that thing is. Some of you, if you want to be really great at a sport, you got to be a disciple of that sport and you have to say no to all sorts of other things and you have to say, yes, I'm going to be all about conditioning and drills and playbooks and, and whatever it takes to, for my coach to, to, to get me uh, in line for this particular sport. Some of you, if you want to be really good uh, at music, same thing. you got to say no to a whole lot of things and just drill in and be really, really focused on whatever that musical thing is. It's saying no to all sorts of things and yes to what's really, really important to you. Some of you want to be really good at your job, at your career, and so you can't just say yes to everything. If you, are, if you have a job, a career that requires you to focus and get narrow, you got to say no to a whole lot of other things that are going on in the office. And yes to the work in front of you. That's what it means to be a disciple. It just means saying no to all the stuff that you want to do, that's fun to do, that's interesting to do, that keeps our minds occupied, occupied and say yes to these things that are really, really important. And so I want to ask you this morning, are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you saying no? 
to all the other things in your life, all those other priorities, and yes to Jesus. Because Jesus says, if you want to follow me, all those other things are fine. But the number one priority is walking with me. And that's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require <coughs> commitment. And it is going to require saying no to a whole lot of other things. You know, we've been talking about discipleship uh, come, you know, coming up on a year and a half now. And I've had some people that have said to me, I don't want to be a part of your church. It sounds like a high commitment church. Others of people have just not been a part of our church. And I've seen them slide into a pew at another church because it's so much easier to just... I mean, how many of you guys know it's just really easy to slide into a pew at a church and you kind of sit under the radar. All you got to do is show up, right? That's not this church, folks. Remember about the rudder and the propeller? We are a high commitment church and we're not going to make any apologies for it because we believe that this is what discipleship is all about. It's about sacrifice. It's about commitment. It's about walking with Jesus. It's about going through the narrow gate that Jesus has called us to. And that's not easy. I understand. I understand. I get it. Next week, there'll be three of you here. <laughs> right? This is what happens. People start preaching the tough stuff. And they're like, whoa, I didn't know I was part of that church. <laughs> All right. Are we serious about discipleship or are we just going to talk about it? I want to live it. See, this sermon's for me too, folks. I'm, I'm not just preaching to you. You got to know this is for me too. In fact, this is probably first and foremost for me because I'm tired of being just a little complacent. In fact, a lot complacent. I want to be focused on Jesus and make him the priority of my life. And I want to invite you to come along for the journey. And together we do this thing called church together. I want to be about being a follower of Jesus and making disciples of other people. Now, here's one last thing I want to close with this. Growing disciples who make or who grow disciples. Under that first disciples, that's, you could just write your name. You could write me. You can write your name. So we want to be about growing each one of you who grow disciples. You might want to write under that other disciples, others, someone else. And why is that important? I want to be very clear. Because church is not about you. It's not about you. We want you to grow. But this church does not exist for you or for any of us in this room. We exist for those who do not know Jesus, who are not walking with Jesus. And if, we just, if we're just focused on ourselves, we're just going to be this group that keeps getting together and it's really fun, right? It's really neat. It's really interesting. It's great to be about community. But guess what? That is not why Jesus created the church. He said, go, go and make disciples to those people who do not know me. And so we're not just about me, but it's about you. I want you to grow in your following of Jesus. But you have a responsibility, every single one of you, and I do too. And it's about growing others, and it's about growing people who are not yet here. And I believe then we actually live into the Great Commission. He's going to do some extraordinary stuff through our lives and through this community. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, um, first of all, for your call in our lives to follow you. And God, we know that um, 
You invited all sorts of people to follow you, prostitutes, tax collectors, um, Pharisees, religious people. God, you didn't discriminate. You invited everyone to follow you. And that includes me and every person in this room here today. We thank you, God, for that call, for that invitation. But God, this is where it gets really hard, really difficult. You've called us, God, to be followers of you. And we know, Lord, where that ended, how things ended up with you. It took you to the cross. And God, you are calling us to die with you so that we might live, so that the world might know. Guide us, Lord. Humble us, strengthen us. Convict us and encourage us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.